Hi, this is Zoe Routh, and I love working with CEOs and teams on their people stuff. What I've discovered in writing my new book called People Stuff, <laughs> that was a surreptitious plug for my new book that's coming out at the end of July, I've discovered there are patterns in people stuff, and it's a large part of what I write about in the book. And then there's the stuff that breaks all the patterns that throws you for a loop. <laughs> my guest today is a seasoned leader who's seen it all with lots of experience, and she comes across as very calm and centered and composed. And she shares her insights from having seen it all and being surprised nonetheless when strange stuff happens. Her name is Jenny Kitchen. She is the CEO of Woden Community Service. This is a large for-purpose agency in the ACT here in Canberra. It provides a multitude of community services. It has 400 staff, 80 volunteers, and an annual turnover of 20 million. So it's a, it's a big business. It's the first CEO position that she has held, and she has worked in a number of different leadership positions in the community sector and in government. She has overseen welfare services in South Australia, New South Wales, and the ACT with organizations like Bernardo's and Anglicare. She has been on numerous community sector boards as either a chair or as a, as a member. She has a BA degree, a Bachelor of Social Work degree, and a Master's of Business Administration. She has a wealth of expertise, and I'm delighted to bring her to the show with you. If you enjoyed this episode, share it. That would be awesome because sharing is caring and it helps spread the word and other people can learn from amazing leaders like Jenny. Okay, let's do it. Jenny, so good to see you and to have you on the podcast. I'm excited to hear all your deep wisdom. Thank you, Zoe. Welcome and lovely to be here. <laughs> First question, you know, you've had a number of different leadership roles and you've been in both government and the community sector. How do you define leadership? For me, it's very much about being alongside people, but also one step ahead. And I recently read something quite beautiful around that need to be alongside rather than always ahead because I'd always thought look, you need to bring people along with you they need to follow you but in actual fact the strength is also having them with you so for me that's one of the kind of pinnacles around being a good leader is how do you do both to bring people with you well it's attention right so one step ahead is meaning forward focused and where are we going and then making sure that everybody's up to speed with that. How do you actually manage that? I think I'm pretty good at consulting with people. And I always, and particularly in this coronavirus period, and we can talk about that more later, but I've really been reminded of the strength of group thinking and that I don't have the answer for everything in a, at a particular point in time. But there are definitely times when people really need me to stand up, step out, make the decision, take the direction, push the organisation forward, and I can't always do that relying on necessarily everybody around me. I'm sometimes going to just have to do that myself. Yeah, and that's, that's the privilege and the pressure of being in the, top, in the top role where you have the ultimate authority and responsibility uh, and can be a big burden to bear. How do you deal with that pressure? I've always had some really rich things outside of my life. So whether it's my swimming, my family, uh, my children, my reading, my garden, nourishing my soul outside of work has kept me very, I think, centred and focused and strong in the workplace. And I just think that that's, um, you can't underestimate that sort of centredness that's really important to keep you calm and focused on where you're going. It's just really been a life force. And, you know, I've been through some really tough times personally in my life, some really tough times in um, the workplace. And coming back to some of those things that ground me and centre me um, have just been vital. I love that practice. You know, my first book was called Composure, How Centred Leaders Make the Biggest Impact. So thank you for being an exemplar of that. And a big part of that book was talking about looking after yourself first. And it's one of the things that I've lived, lived by as well, is that when we look after ourselves First, we have more of ourselves to give. So that's great to hear that that actually works in practice from, from people on the ground in, in tough leadership conditions. So the second part of my very first question is, over such a long career, when did you first realize you could do the leadership thing? 
Was there a particular moment where you went, oh my goodness, I, I guess I kind of got this? Well, I was thrown into leadership or I found myself in leadership very young. Uh, so I'd been out of university for two years and at the age of 26, I suddenly found myself leading a team, um, a very complex team of multidiscipline professions who gave me a really hard time. But what a teething sort of experience that was. And I never looked back in terms of leadership roles. So while that was sort of a strength and also a weakness in the sense that I I never practiced long at the front line. So I always had to, I guess, learn my content of what's happening on the front line from the people that are working to me and with me. I guess it came to me, I think when I had come to work for Bernardo's, and that was probably about 20, 23 years ago, when I found myself in that role with a really excellent mentor and I realised, gosh, I actually can do this even though there's a whole heap of challenges and there's a number of things about my personality, my background and my experience that are actually making me a leader that's somewhat effective, but I'm such a work in progress and I've always felt really strongly that I'm really a work in progress. And even now in my you know, last stages of my career and you know, having had lots of experience, I keep thinking about how I can be a bit better or learn differently or whatever it might be. That's a good philosophy. I'm a work in progress. And it protects us against one of the big traps in people stuff, which is hubris and that arrogance that comes with thinking that we know anything. We know everything. And it tends to hit us sometimes early, around that 26-year-old mark, actually, where we think, I've got this. <laughs> and then we quickly work out, no, I know nothing. So I'm curious about that. That first experience that you mentioned where they, you said your team gave you such a hard time. What was it in the people stuff that was so hard about that experience? Like what, what kinds of things happened that challenged you? A couple of things which I think young managers and leaders really experienced it was, was one was simply my age. So people working to me, some of them were twice my age. And not only was there a life experience and a, and a wisdom that they had that I didn't have at that stage, but also they had a whole lot of content knowledge that I didn't have simply because and I hadn't worked in the area for so long. So it's a really tough gig when you manage people who in that situation. And I've done a lot of thinking and reflection on what young people bring to the workplace versus older people. And just before the COVID crisis, I was about to form, and it's on hold really, I did a random selection of 12 staff across the organisation under the age of 30 to bring together to be my advisory group on young people's view of not only the world but a view of the organisation because I just think that I have, knowing from my children uh, when I see how they see the world, they see the, do see the world in different ways at different times. And I think as, a, as an older CEO, of which many of us are, particularly in the welfare world, we really need to look at what young people can tell us rather than put them down and say, oh, well, you know, you're just, um, you know, you're just Gen Y, Gen X. We, we don't need to recognise what you've got to offer. And what have you learned in doing that? So I'm curious about that now. So as um, when you go to talk to the Gen Ys and Gen Zs, what kinds of things are you surprised at in terms of their perspective versus yours? Well, the problem I've got at the moment is that group was about to start and I put it on hold. So I'm yet to hear from them how they, you know, the sorts of things. But the sorts of things I'm imagining I will start to hear is how they want to be communicated with and whether the ways I'm talking to them in relation to IT and social media works for them. Am I making their workplaces flexible enough? Do they have a voice in the organisation? We have a large number of young people working for us um, in our organisation. Are they heard? So it's those sorts of things. I'm, I'm curious to see what they're going to tell me, but those are some of the things I think they might tell me. Are these the kind of things that your kids talk about as well? Yes, I'm amazed at how much, how much more my children are clearer or more assertive about their rights in the workplace. And that's something that I certainly was far less uh, confident about aggressively pursuing I was very uh, as a younger person I, I and that was more sort of deference for the authority I'm not sure if there'd be a whole reason or there's a generational thing but certainly my kids negotiate and are much stronger about their entitlements and I think I'm interested to hear the young people in our workplace whether they feel that that's how they want to operate in a greater way with us 
and are we responding to that and how are we responding to it? So I just think that's an interesting difference. That is a big difference. And it, um, it pulls the thread of this meme that says that Gen Y is the entitled generation. They feel like they're entitled. I'm not sure that that's what you actually meant when, when you're talking about people asking and asserting their rights as opposed to their, what they believe they're entitled to. Or was it? Is it that they negotiate their rights more effectively or ask for them or are more assertive about them? Or is it do you feel like they feel like they deserve more than what they're getting? Or is it both? I think it's the first I think they, you know, they don't hesitate, my children certainly don't hesitate to negotiate work conditions, uh, of flexibility, uh, are very clear about the fact that they've got something to offer the employer and vice versa. And I think that's that's quite But I know some, certainly in my organisation, I am really interested in around the IT stuff because I just think that we need to do some more different and interesting things in the way we use our team and social media and communicating with, with young people and what they can offer us on that platform as well. Yeah, well, we hear a lot about that, about the younger generations being tech savvy. And um, yeah, I feel it. I've just ordered a new computer and it's been sitting on my table for a week going... Uh, I have to pick it up and I have to learn how to transfer files and figure out how to set it up all properly. And I'm just like, just don't want to <laughs> mm. just park it over there because it's going to take a little bit of cognitive load to process that. Whereas our um, digital friendly younger folk will just pick it up and play with it and find it more intuitive. So, yeah, I think that's a good pursuit. I like the idea of having a young people's advisory group. Uh, and I think the organizations that incorporate a diversity of views, including youthful ones, are the ones that are going to progress and adapt more readily. That's for sure. So I'm curious to like, you've had a couple of solid beliefs um, and principles in leadership. One of them is, you know, keeping an open mind and being a work in progress is one of the key principles. Can you think of a time when you've had your perspective on could be life, could be leadership, could be on organisations turned on its head? It's a great question. And probably about in the early 90s, I, I'd done an arts degree and I'd done a social work degree before I started work in the community sector. And sometime later, I then decided to do an MBA, which was fantastic because it gave me a context for the leadership management work that I was doing. And one of the units I did was women in management. And at that time, the thinking was very much around, the discourse was very much around the really distinctively different qualities that women could bring to leadership management so that they would be more caring, much more nurturing, and would bring a whole lot of different characteristics that men wouldn't naturally bring to the workplace. So I was really, you know, you know, sort of strong feminists really loved this this analysis, and you know could relate to it a lot. I you know I thought I had a lot of those qualities, and that I would be able to bring all that to the organisation. Over the next ten, maybe fifteen years, I either worked for or I inherited staff who had worked for incredibly tough women, women who were you know, displayed some pretty tough bullying behaviour, who were really hard, hard poor women to work for. And that just confronted big time my, this sort of gender analysis I had had about management. And during that time, I was also, you know, had opportunities to work for men who displayed some of those, you know, traditionally, you know, uh, female leadership qualities around caring and nurturing. So it just made me reflect a lot on the fact that a gender analysis of management and leadership was just far too simplistic and that people were much more complex beings and that I couldn't categorise and slot people into leadership styles on that kind of analysis. So it was a, it was a very confronting turn of thinking for me because I had so strongly wanted to support that theory in lots of ways, but it actually didn't turn out in practice for me personally. The, yeah, there's nothing more confronting than having, first of all, a set of beliefs and an idea and a principles put in front of you saying, yes, women are good at leadership because of these attributes and they, they add value. And it's like, yeah, I'm good. I can bring that to the table. And then all of a sudden you meet the antithesis 
of that, where you have a female leader who is not caring, not compassionate, and it's a bit of a brute and brutal and particularly brutish towards other women. I've had that experience as well. And it's like, why? <laughs> Where's the sisterhood? Where is all this great, you know, you're supposed to be pioneering spirits for, for other women in the workplace. And we've heard about those women. That's come out a lot in the last sort of 10 years, that, um, that myth of all women leaders are caring and nurturing. And there's a good proportion who got ahead in business because they were not that. They were more male, that was air quotes, in their approach, meaning they were more assertive and aggressive. And they weren't committed to the sisterhood. They were committed to their own career. And I think you have lots of male leaders who, who act the same way, who act for their own best interests and will trample on others to get to where they want. And they feel no obligation to raise up others around them. They're called narcissists, and they're not that fun to be around. Yeah, it is kind of deflating when you have that experience. When you go, oh, that generalization doesn't work. And you're right, people are way more complex than we give them credit for um, quite often. So with people stuff, you know, leadership is all about people stuff. What do you find the most challenging? Um, I think one of the things is, and it's been interesting in this COVID virus again, is being reminded of how people's behaviour defaults into certain patterns when they're really stressed. And this has been an interesting time because not only has the workplace been very stressful in terms of rapid changes and impact, but also that people are experiencing in their own personal lives particular stresses. And it's very rare that you would have workplace stress and outside stress conflating at exactly the same time. So seeing those behaviours which have not always been particularly good and constantly having to remember that there's an explanation for those but I've still got to manage those, I think that's a tough gig. I think the other thing that always surprises me is I think when you've worked a long time in leadership, you think you've seen it all in terms of people's behaviour or what people do and then someone does something and you just go, my goodness, I can't believe that. You know, whether it's fraud, whether it's seriously terrible stuff that they might do in the workplace or outside of the workplace, and you just think, I mean, you think you kind of think you've understood people and that you've got it, and then out of the blue you'll get this sort of incredibly unusual behaviour and you go, wow, people are extraordinarily unpredictable. You know, you think there's a pattern, but there's not a pattern, Uh, and that always amazes me. That's so funny you say that because I'm just writing uh, people stuff, my next book at the moment, and I offer several patterns, I guess, or maps to behavior to help us decipher some of that stuff. And then you're right, like you think you've got like a nice little map to read the territory, and then there's this anomaly thing that comes out of the blue. It's like, what the, where, what? <laughs> where did that come from? Yeah, I wasn't expecting that. Are you really capable of doing that? And so when you deal with something like that, let's say it's fraud, as you mentioned it. How do you process that internally? Do, like as a leader, do you feel, I'm projecting now, do you feel betrayed by that or do you just sort of park your own emotional um, side effects and, and then deal with it? So how do, you, how do you actually process that? I usually start off being really disappointed because I think I'm a really fair, considered and kind leader. So when someone does stuff that is really bad, I start off by almost being a bit personally shocked because I think, look, hold on, we've been really good to you and you've turned around and and done that. So there's there's an element of feeling really let down. And then I move just very quickly, I think, into, okay, we've got some problems here, we've got to get, you know, legal advice or financial advice. But I also try and, I guess because of my welfare background and also having done a fair bit of training on trauma-informed, you know, try and pick apart the why. So I'm really interested in the why. Like what triggered something in somebody to do that? Whether it's been part of some, having worked in the child welfare world for many years, some horrific things that happen to children. And that might be from occasionally from workers. It might be from, you know, in families. And, and you know, whether it's that extreme or whether it's, you know, some kind of fraud, I always just sit back and try and think what was happening, why, why did that happen? But also I think they're great opportunities to learn. So what happened there that would, well, how could we stop that next time? 
So, you know, so again, for continuous improvement for me, it's always a continuous improvement for the organisation. And I think those, you know, any critical incident is a fantastic opportunity to look at, well, what are we going to learn from here and how are we going to do it differently next time? That's wonderful insight. Yeah, I think reaching for the, the asking the why, like what's underneath this, you know, people aren't, they don't wake up every day going, I'm going to be a jerk. You know, I'm going to sabotage things deliberately. There's a small, tiny percentage of people who are a little bit disconnected that way. They aren't wired properly. They are few and far between. Largely, it's a whole, it's a whole mountain of things that they've had to climb in their lives that given those kinds of choices that they feel they're compelled to take. Now that we're immersed in a pandemic, as a leader, what do you think your core responsibilities are right now? And what are the most difficult challenges that you're facing through this? I think one of the things that I found really important is to communicate like I've never communicated in terms of frequency and different forms. So the, just on that, what, what are you actually doing? Yeah, so my executive and I meet every morning from nine o'clock to 10. And we've been doing that for the last six weeks. Every morning? Every morning. So wow. we're there. And then out of that comes at least two emails to all staff. I've got 400 staff in the organisation. Uh, about things that they need to know and things that we're doing. And then I also am doing a weekly video to the whole of the organisation just so that they can see me, they can hear me, and I talk about various things on that. So I hadn't realised, I was into the CURP crisis about 10 days and I hadn't done much of that until I got feedback about we need more of you. So, um, more, so that was really interesting that I should have been out there on day one rather than on day seven or eight. One of the things I think I've, and this has actually frustrated, I think, some people is that I am very calm and some people have wanted, I think, me to be a bit more heightened with the drama. And I've in most cases tried to resist that because there's enough drama around this coronavirus already and me displaying drama is just not going to be helpful at all. So I've actually reverted consistently to being extremely calm. The other thing I think, and it was interesting, one of your other podcasts I listened to, which was there was a line that was so useful. It's about make the decision really quickly and if it's the wrong one, uh, don't worry about it too much. You can kind of go back and change that later. And I have found that fantastically useful because in the early days we simply had to make heaps of decisions really fast and really quickly and not all of them were right. But procrastinating as your previous speaker on that podcast has said, procrastinating would have been worse. And I have consistently taken that message to my senior executives and said, let's decide this today. We're going to do this today. I don't mind if next week we come back and change that decision because it may have been wrong. So that's been some of the things that I have found really useful. I've also had a board that took a position of standing back rather than micromanaging uh, with anxiety They were very clearly saying, this is the time for you to lead. You come to us when you need us. Uh, Write reports. You know, every couple of weeks I've been writing reports to them about how we're going. But um, I've used them on a sort of consultancy basis, really, and they've been fantastic. Whereas I know in other situations I've got CEOs um, as colleagues who are having to meet weekly, twice weekly with their board to keep them regularly informed all the time and run through decisions with them. And I think in a time of crisis, that's not been particularly helpful. It certainly wouldn't have been for me. Yeah, well, this sort of speaks a little bit to the relationship between the board and the CEO and their confidence in the CEO's ability to manage it. Um, So, yeah, that doesn't sound too helpful. The interview you're talking about is Tony Pergolin, and I'll put a link in the show notes for people who are interested in going in to listening to her. She was, that interview was about her experience of doing a massive turnaround for a a not-for-profit organization that was struggling. And yeah, she definitely had that as a, as a core principle, make a decision and you can change it later, but you got to act in the best interest of the organization now. You got to just act quickly now. I love what you, I'm really curious about what you said about your staff wanting to see you a bit more hyped up. <laughs> and is it that they're looking to see some sort of vulnerability or humanity? What, what do you think that's about? I think in this case, they were bringing their incredible anxiety from outside in. So it was real anxiety about people catching the virus from each other. So 
we should automatically send everybody home within seconds. We should be stopping all frontline services. Um, so it was their anxiety, I think, that brought into play. And that my calmness about PANG5, we actually have just got to be fairly measured about how we do this. How do we balance the seriousness of risk versus the obligation that we've got to our clients versus our duty of care to, st to our staff? So it was constantly balancing those all the time. But I guess I just wasn't prepared to take on the incredible anxiety that was in various pockets of the community into the organisation because I just felt that was such an unproductive way of leading and managing and communicating decisions. That's quite a bit different, like in terms of expressing vulnerability and, and openness. What do you think about vulnerability and openness as a leader and how do you express it? Well, I did actually express it at one stage because about in the second week with my executive, we were having this terribly difficult discussion around people with disabilities needing us to be in there supporting them, but we didn't have enough protective equipment for our staff. So was it a greater risk to have people in there or out of there? And I just at one stage felt quite overwhelmed in one of the meetings around two things. One was that we were having to lay off at that stage a whole lot of staff before we could get the job keeper. So I was incredibly anxious about staff's their livelihoods, and at the same time, I actually didn't know what to do. And I burst into tears in the middle of the meeting and I just said, I actually don't know what to do. I don't know what the answer is for these particular clients. After I'd done that, the next couple of days, I actually felt much better because I kind of put myself out there as, well, I'm not going to be the source of all, all knowledge at times. And all of them came back to me and said, it was great to see that. We, re, we have a whole lot of confidence in you and they were glad I did that. So I don't need to cry openly to show my vulnerabilities. I think that, that's very rare. Um, that was, you know, I, I would hardly ever do that. I guess in other ways I often use my own personal experience and I say, you know, I'll talk about things that are happening for me and how I've struggled with something um, either in, oh, quite often in, you know, earlier times of my life. So that's another way I share vulnerabilities. Or I would talk quite openly about meetings where I've really struggled to know how to come to a resolution or a board meeting where I have felt particularly confronted by some of the questions. So I have no difficulty, I think, in sharing that because I think that's a learning for them about, well, if I was in that situation, how might I grapple with that as well? I think that's what you're talking about there and demonstrating is that there's a big difference between being calm and cold and calm and open. And the way that you describe how you tackle it is calm and open. And it's clear to me that you've got your emotions. They're not in the driver's seat. They're kind of in the passenger seat. And so you can talk to the things that are in your passenger seat without letting them get behind the wheel. And I think um, that's a really useful strategy for leaders to keep in mind is that we can't just take our emotions and put them in the trunk and pretend they're not there because that's when they will come through and overwhelm from time to time is that we can put them in the passenger seat and go yep yeah, this is my experience I'm troubled by this or I'm anxious by this or I don't know about this and we're still be driving calmly along the road you know <laughs> talking to this passenger that we've got alongside us and I think that's encouraging. That kind of openness and admission that we have feelings and that they're there is quite different experience for the people that we lead than saying, being that calm and cold, it's like, this is what we're going to do. I'm not bothered by this. I'm pretending not to be bothered by this. And that's not reassuring for folks. But it's not the drama side either, <laughs> which is the other way. And we don't build rapport by being dramatic. That's for sure. I wanted to ask you about you know, the different kinds of leadership because leading the organization that you're leaving now, a purpose welfare agency, is quite different to a corporate organization and I'm guessing is quite different to a government organization. Can you tell me a little bit about what you see the differences between leading the kind of organization that you're leading now and those other types? I think the frontline work that people do in an organization like this one where you've got homelessness services and elderly people support, aged care, disability, is that the frontline work is really tough and it's, it's emotionally draining and it's tough work, uh, which makes it fundamentally different to if I was, you know, working in an IT company or whatever else it might be. 
So it throws up a whole lot of questions, I think, as a leader about, well, how am I going to look after those workers to make sure they can work well with those clients? So the culture has to be much more, well, not much more, because I think you should, you know, you need a caring culture uh, for any organisation, but um, a compassionate and caring culture is really important. And if I'm asking, you know, frontline workers to be supporting families who've got really issues with their, you know, child protection issues or whatever it might be, then I need to be looking after our workers in relation to their family lives. So there can't be a disjunction between their work that they're doing and their, how they're relating to their clients and how I actually support the organisation, how I support them as family members, as workers. So I think that's, that's quite a, a fundamental difference. I think the other thing is that you tend to attract um, a lot of people who have worked mainly in the welfare or been trained in welfare work. So they don't necessarily come with a good economic business sense and are also often kinder to staff in the sense that they'll often let lots of behaviours just happen because they want to kind of be caring rather than firm with staff. So I guess I've had to bring more, and I learned my MBA was fabulous in this because it suddenly brought a whole world of economic analysis, financial analysis, marketing, business that I just had never got in, in a social work world of training or qualifications. And so I think you've got to battle that a bit with staff and push them to look at the harder side of running an organisation and looking at the tougher side of managing people that we can't just be all sharing and caring. We do have staff that we need to work with and we need to improve their skills. We need to performance manage them if need be. And we've also got to make lots of tough decisions around economics and finances and businesses and IT. So that's one of the things I find quite different. I agree with that. Having worked in not-for-profits for 30 years and then moving to running my own business and then consulting back into different organizations. And that's one of, one of the core challenges I see in leaders who go from the private sector, say, to leading a not-for-profit is that they're often confronted with this values difference. And I think what you're, that's exactly how you, you've described it, is that there's some, the prioritization of values of staff who work at the front lines in, in service-based organizations is very much care and compassion. And money, efficacy, and performance is not up there on the same level. And I think you need all of that, and they need to be in tandem. And I think, again, it's a swing between the two of them. It's kind of like what you're describing, be one foot ahead and have people alongside you. You kind of need to do the money business side as well as the people performance side. And um, that's an educational process as the leader with, with your teams, because I think until you make those values visible, to your team and say, these are the values by which you're operating and we need, these are the values by which we need to operate. We can't necessarily see the chasm or the gap between them until we do. And I think that's an advanced leadership skill for sure, to be able to make all of that recognizable and articulated and, and then try and bridge the gap with people. It's quite, um, yeah, it's one of the extra things on your plate <laughs> when you come to lead an organization that's service-based, that's for sure much easier, I'd say, to have an organization which is about providing service and a product and you just get on with it. And um, Sometimes that feels easier, but maybe I'm, I'm being naive in that way too. Last sort of couple questions for you. How do you define success now for yourself as a leader? I think one of the things has been that I have people who continue to want to really work with me and for me. And that, for me, is always a really lovely way of saying, you know, you've been a good leader, you've been successful at what you're doing and you continue to be and I want to follow you and be with you. So that's a kind of nonverbal way, I think, of saying you're doing okay. Obviously, if you get verbal feedback that's very directly saying, I really, you know, I like your leadership, I like working for you, um, that's always a good affirmation. I think the other thing ex externally is if you've got government, that, that's kind of one of my key stakeholders, obviously, is government and other um, organisations wanting to work with you and get you to run some of the programs for them. So when you're consistently being approached by government or other providers to work in partnership 
with that for me is a good sign that you're doing some good stuff and you are running a pretty good organisation. Those are a couple of the things that, that I think. I think the other thing is one of the things I've, I've been constantly reminded of is the importance of getting out there. So I am regularly out there on the front line talking to staff, going to team meetings, uh, and I feel really strongly that I, I need to hear from all levels of the organisation as to what's happening. And I will bypass all managers. I'm very open with the fact I'm doing it, but I've always got my ear to the ground with people so that they know me and they know that if they've got an issue that they feel that they cannot grapple with through the normal channels of the organisation, they can actually come directly to me. So I think that, I mean, it's an old tenet of management, but the walking around the floor is just so important. And I think I've done that increasingly so, more and more and more and more so over the years and can only just see how it reaps extraordinary benefits in, in every single way. That makes for a successful leadership quality. Last question. <laughs> What's the best piece of advice you've ever been given? Oh, that's a really good question. I think it's not it's not something I've been given but I've read and I can't even remember who it was but it was the message around good leaders listen more than they talk and I have to keep reminding myself how important that is when I'm sitting in a room it's really easy for the most senior person in the room to take up the most airspace and I just constantly remember that quote, that I need to listen, I need to listen, I need to listen. And I just think it's such a great lesson. Oh, I love it. And it's a very practical one too. I was reading about a hack for that. If a leader is finding themselves talking or wants to see who's contributing the most in their meetings is to write a list of everybody's name in the meeting. And during the meeting, just make a tick next to the person's name whenever they share anything. And then you get a nice little graphic view of who said how much in the meeting. And uh, it's a lovely one. I think, and you're absolutely right, is that good leaders listen more than they talk. And it is a good, really good principle. Jenny, that's been amazing to have you on the call. I just love your insights and your wisdom and your demeanor. Definitely a centered and composed leaders. It, it's uh, just been a pleasure um, hearing you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Zoe. I loved talking to Jenny. She is so composed. <laughs> I just would love to work for her and with her. So I love that she has that as a definition of success, that if people actually want to pitch in and, and work with you, I think that's an awesome sign that success is working. So many great takeaways from this interview. I love her philosophy of I'm a work in progress. It's nice to remember that so that we can keep our heads down and our hubris out of the way. I love also how she says good leaders listen more than they talk. It was a wonderful interview. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did like it and you did love it, please share. Send it to someone you care about who would value this interview and get some insights from it, just like you did. And if you have a leader you think it would be great to hear from and that I should interview, please make a recommendation. Feel free to send me an email, zoe at intercompass.com.au, and let me know about the leader you think would be wonderful to have on the show. In the meantime, live well, lead well.